This month on In Case You Missed It, Rhode Island oceanographer Bob Ballard recounts finding the Titanic in 1985, which was flanked between two nuclear submarines. Now in his 80s, he's still on the hunt, exploring new worlds and unraveling some of history's most puzzling mysteries, including what may have happened to aviator Amelia Earhart. As part of our continuing My Take series, High Tide Mushroom Farm owner and operator Sam Morgan provides a lesson on edible fungi. And we uncover the true story behind the creation of the Situate Reservoir. All this and much more in case you missed it. Welcome to In Case You Missed It, where we look back at some of the best local content on Rhode Island PBS, plus give you a sneak peek at exciting new content coming soon to your screen. First up, we introduce you to a local man who has spent most of his life visiting underwater worlds. His adventures are legend, and while his name may not be well known to you, his discoveries are blockbuster. I'm the king of the world! Bob Ballard's most remarkable discovery inspired the classic Academy Award-winning movie, Titanic. I'm really an Earth scientist, but it turns out that's most of the planet is under the ocean. So I'm studying my, my, my planet, but in, in the meantime, bump into things. Things such as the real Titanic. In 1985, Ballard became world famous from his discovery of its remains and the film that followed. Ballard says he's seen the movie only a couple of times, the first with its creator, Jim Cameron. I knew that the old, what I say, the old lady in her grave. I know what the old lady looked like. Jim so accurately replicated it, I got to see the beautiful ship that she was. The largest ocean liner of its time hit an iceberg in the North Atlantic on its maiden voyage in 1912 and sank off Newfoundland. More than 1,500 died in the disaster. Just recently, the haunting original video of the watery grave was re-released. But beyond Titanic, Ballard is like the Lewis and Clark of the sea on a mapping expedition of what he believes is the next frontier. His voyage of discovery began when the compass pointed him in the direction of the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography more than a half century ago. Dr. Ballard, you are oceanographer, explorer, adventurer. You are a naval intelligence officer and commander, archeologist, author, professor, of all of these titles, which one describes you best? Oh, I, I love uh, an explorer. I boldly go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. You can't have a better job than that. That job of a lifetime started to take shape when he was introduced as a child to Jules Verne's classic tale. I didn't read the book 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I went and saw the movie when I was 12 years old. He says he watched the movie because he couldn't read well. Ballard has what's known as a learning difficulty, but he views it differently. I'm dyslexic and I'm very proud of it. I see things people don't see. See, I live in a world of complete darkness. And so I have to imagine it. And dyslexics have a powerful ability to form visual imagery in our right side of our brain. I gotta stop you there because you have been extraordinarily successful in life. How? did you navigate dyslexia to make the discoveries you've made? Well, I did good in school, but I, I, I had to memorize everything. And I would go in to take the exam, close my eyes, and see the answer. So you see dyslexia as an advantage. It's a, it's a gift. You can watch the full Rhode Island PBS Weekly story on ripbs.org weekly. Up next, as part of our continuing My Take series, we take you to Coventry, Rhode Island to meet a man who's passionate about fungus. Well, at least the edible kind. Mushrooms are for everybody that enjoys to consume them. My name is Sam Morgan. I am the owner and operator of High Tide Mushroom Farm, and this is my take on mushrooms. Mushrooms are the plant-like structure of fungi. They have a stem, they have a cap, some have veils, but all are pretty great.
we have a plethora of different mushrooms that we grow, dependent on the season. If it's cold weather, we focus more on cold tolerant species of mushrooms, whether it's golden gnocchi, king oysters, blue oysters, chestnut mushrooms. And then when the weather starts warming up, we kind of try to switch our rooms over to warmer weather tolerant mushrooms, whether it's pink oyster mushrooms, yellow oyster mushrooms, piapino mushrooms, phoenix oyster or the Italian oyster mushroom, king blue oysters, and so on. I got into mushrooms for a few reasons. I was a firefighter and paramedic 10 years prior to getting into the agricultural realm of mushroom cultivation. Mushrooms are like the coral of the land. They are great remediators and filtration devices for not only our land, but they are great filter devices for our water as well. Welcome to the French Chef. I'm Julia Child. We're doing mushrooms today. All kinds of ways to use them. You know, you can hardly think of French cooking without mushrooms. The French call them champignons. So when people hear the term gourmet mushrooms, they usually think of blue oyster or anything within the oyster family of mushroom, which are great mushrooms. They are protein dense, uh, full of unami flavor. They add a nice texture to whatever you're cooking. They can take center stage of a meal or they can be an accessory to a meal to add some flavor. There are other gourmet mushrooms. We have lion's mane, we have piapino mushrooms, we have golden aki mushrooms. And all these mushrooms have different kind of flavors, different kind of textures, and they add something special to every meal. There's uh, two, I would say two different schools of thought when people first look at lion's mane, like, oh, what's that? Or, ooh, what's that? It's, uh, it's a pretty cool mushroom. It's neuroadaptive. So anything to do with the brain, it helps stimulate NGF growth in the brain. So anything with uh, you know, motor function, sensory perception, ADD, ADHD, OCD, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia, lion's mane is being studied for because of the compounds within it. Not all mushrooms are edible. If you're gonna go out foraging, go through the woods and start looking for mushrooms because you're excited to get into the realm of mushrooms and mycology, I would say, you know, start with getting to know your environment. Start to get to know your trees, what locations you're looking to start searching, and what kind of mushrooms you're looking for. It's not necessarily too hard if you start to zone in and focus on one or two mushrooms you want to find in your area. And you can do so in a couple different ways. I would say pick up an encyclopedia that, you know, deals with mushrooms. Or also there's apps nowadays that you could take a photo of a mushroom and it will give a statistical probability of what that mushroom is. So if you're doing a little bit of cross-referencing and you're getting out into the woods and you're seeing some mushrooms you like or you, you know, want to take home, maybe take some spore prints, I would say you need to be 100% confident on your choice before putting it in your, in your mouth. Mushrooms are a hot topic right now, and to me that's no surprise. Uh, mushrooms are not only delicious, but the mycelium of mushrooms, which is the root-like structure of mushrooms that connects the mushroom to the ground or its fruiting substrate, has several applications. Packing peanuts are gonna be replaced with mycelium. Alternative leather for shoes and clothing is gonna be mycelium-based. NASA is also studying to use mycelium as the structural basis to any kind of housing structure whether it be on Mars or our interplanetary travels. Mushrooms, or the spores of mushrooms, can live in the vacuum of time and space. My name is Sam Morgan, and this has been my take on mushrooms. You can watch the full Rhode Island PBS Weekly story on ripbs.org weekly. And don't forget to tune in for new episodes of Rhode Island PBS Weekly, Sundays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore on Wednesdays. Our next segment comes from Story in the Public Square, where best-selling author and human rights activist Azar Nafisi talks about the power of literature in the fight against tyranny. 2014, you published uh, The Republic of Imagination. Yeah. Uh, and you were picking up on something uh, that the rest of us maybe were not at that point, but this authoritarian, autocratic tendency in American politics. You see this as a threat to the West in general uh, and globally. What cued you in that there was something afoot uh, with this new rising appeal to authoritarianism? 
Well, first of all, it's amazing to be here today. Thank you. Um, well, you know, uh, I think um, this is one of the advantages of being an immigrant, uh, because you look at your new home through the eyes of the old one. And so I became sensitized to certain trends here in the United States that I had seen happen uh, already in more extreme fashion um, in uh, Iran. And it wasn't actually, it didn't start with censor. Uh, it started with the indifference that I saw in people. Uh, you know, Ray Bradbury talks about you don't have to burn books to make to destroy a culture. All you have to do is to make people not read. And that is what was happening. There was this sort of a um, utilitarian attitude uh, towards uh, uh, imagination and ideas, uh, whereby we were advising our children um, to go into science and um, technology and mathematics not because they were in love with it, not because they were passionate with it, not because they would gain more knowledge, but because it would make more money. Yeah. And uh, so this corporate attitude alongside of ideology um, that I saw uh, almost uh, when I came back to the United States uh, in 97. Did you, um, you mentioned the experience of the Islamic Revolution in your native Iran. Uh, how much, though, does literature and your love of books and all the reading that you've done contributed to that, that sensitivity that you have to these, these broader trends in society? Well, you know, uh, literature is one of the most dangerous things to an authoritarian mindset because literature and arts, imagination and ideas, they're after the truth. And truth is always dangerous because uh, once you know it, you, you become complicit if you don't do something about it. And uh, it is one of the literature becomes in this way, not politicized, but uh, in an existential way. It becomes um, the enemy of authoritarianism because Authoritarian trends, whether they are in the Islamic Republic or as trends in the United States of America, they survive on lies. They are enemies of truth and they confiscate our reality and refabricate it. Uh, so uh, that is why literature becomes so dangerous. Tune in for Story in the Public Square Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. with an encore Sunday mornings at 11. Next, on a lively experiment, host Jim Hummel sits down with Rhode Island Secretary of State Greg Amore to discuss his hopes for same-day voter registration and making the primary election earlier in the year. There have been a lot of bills on voting and elections filed, and you have a handful that you've had filed on your behalf. So let's start with same-day registration. Sure. So same-day registration was part of the bigger Let Rhode Island Vote package, but not passed in the last legislative session. And the interesting part about same-day voter registration in Rhode Island is it requires a constitutional change, right? So it's embedded in the Rhode Island Constitution that the 30-day is the limit. So we would have to have a, a, a referendum question go to the people of Rhode Island who would then determine whether or not that would be removed and same day voter registration would be an option. And at that point, the General Assembly would determine what that actually looks like. The establishment of the 30 day window, and in some states it's 20, Massachusetts is 10, that establishment was really based on uh, bureaucracy, the ability of paper to move from one place to another. Now with the central voter registration system, that barrier no longer exists there's really no reason we can't register folks the day of the election. And it's important to understand that that wouldn't take place at a polling place. That would take place at the city or town hall or a singular designated place where people would register and vote at that same place. So poll workers who only work every two years would not be burdened with a same day registration and vote. You want to move the primary up? We do. We, we, hey. have, a, we have a problem with the primary and that is where the last primary or the second to last primary every year. Um, and because we're so close to the general, we bump into the, um, the Federal MOVE Act, which requires us to send overseas military ballots 
uh, to folks 45 days ahead of the general election. How long has that move back been in, in effect? 1993. Because I haven't heard anything until now. Well, we, we've just been skating on thin ice until now. And just getting by every year? I think what, what has really uh, drawn my attention is that elections are being contested now. And if elections are litigated or there are multiple recounts, now you're going to push, push that result, the certification, off to the point where we're not going to be able to get those ballots out. And if we disenfranchise uh, one of our overseas military personnel, that's, that's just not acceptable. Tune in for a lively experiment Fridays at 7 p.m. with an encore every Sunday at noon. 100 years ago, seven members of the Providence Water Supply Board forcibly removed residents from five villages in Situate, Rhode Island to create a new water supply for the 250,000 residents of the capital city. Today, the Situate Reservoir provides water to two-thirds of the state of Rhode Island. Here's a clip from Blood and Watershed, a film about Rhode Island's water supply. sky opens, runoff accumulates in several unnamed brooks in the northwestern parts of the state of Rhode Island. These waters flow into and form the Ponagansett Reservoir in the town of Gloucester and Meswansicket Lake a few miles east on the Johnston Situate border. From there, these headwaters continue on a southbound course, now as rivers, each carrying the names of their tributaries. The Meswansicket River is regulated at what is known as the Horseshoe Dam in North Situate before flowing onward under the Ashland Causeway and forming the distinct Y shape at the confluence of the Ponagansett to create the Situate Reservoir. A 100-year-old earthen dam then determines the water's fate. The unneeded excess falls over a spillway under Situate Avenue before joining the north branch of the Patuxent River. The Lucky H2O enters a gatehouse in the center of the dam before being conveyed through dual 60-inch steel pipes which converge at the nearby filtration plant operated by Providence Water. Here, the water is aerated, treated with lime, coagulant, fluoride, and other chemicals before entering the delivery system through massive transmission aqueducts. A newer southern aqueduct travels through Kent County, Rhode Island servicing three municipal water providers before meandering back towards the Providence Supply. The original aqueduct from the 1920s surges water underground for seven miles due east, utilizing gravity from the rise of the western hills in the city of Cranston, splitting off to supply sub-reservoirs and a network of feeder mains before crossing under the Picasset River and joining a distribution system originally laid in 1870 under Reservoir Avenue. From there, a pair of 30-inch mains use gravity from Cranston's higher elevation to twist and turn to the taps of the homes and businesses of two-thirds of the state of Rhode Island. This is made possible through 12, 10, 8, and 6-inch mains that are linked to small service lines, many of which contain lead. My students call me Professor Valari, but really, it's just Evan. I'm a fifth generation Italian American whose people first came to Providence in the 1890s. I'm a curious fellow, a filmmaker, a father of three, and a professor of media right in Down City, Providence. In addition to teaching, I'm the founding director of a recording studio space called the Center for Media Production. When I'm not home, this is where I spend most of my time. Contemplating the past. Let me get something to cut it open with.
<laughs> She's got nice writing. Oh my gosh. Hi, Evan. I have finally organized and packed up the watershed documents that I believe you may find useful. In December and January of last year, I took slides of some of the many black and white photographs which were taken in situ before the condemnation of the land and during construction. The reservoir project had such an impact on everyone who was displaced, lost their livelihood, or in some cases lost their lives. And the social, political, economic, and environmental history of this extreme intervention must still play out today. All best wishes in your work for the health and happiness of your family, Gail. Wow, that was really nice. Wow, it's heavy. And she did this, she just called me up and she's just like, look, do you want this stuff? Oh, it is. Okay. Wow. Would you look at this? I'm like shaking. It's so ridiculous. Wow. It's her writing. Here we go. Slides. Under construction, Gaynor Dam, 1924 and 1925, wow. There it is, so that's the condemnation area. Huh? Nails and hook, found by divers in the Situate Reservoir, 1978 to 1980. Divers were given permission by the Water Supply Board to explore the locations of one of the old mill villages. Look at this. Enjoy the rest of this fascinating documentary on watch.ripbs.org. And now, here's a preview of what's coming in June on Rhode Island PBS. On Generation Rising, host Dr. Kiera Butler sits down with Ricardo Pitzwiley, co-founder of Mixed Magic Theater, and his son and artistic director, Jonathan Pitzwiley, to talk about the importance of remembering, celebrating, and honoring Juneteenth. So take me full circle moment. How does your work connect with Juneteenth? Well, you know, I, I think, gosh, um, how much time do we have in the program? <laughs> no. 20 well, minutes. Yeah. So I, I think that the connection with Juneteenth I would, I would tie it most directly to the work that the Exalt Choir does, the Mixed Magic Theater Exalt Choir, which is directed by uh, Kim Morrison Pitts-Wiley, our music director, also my wife. Uh, and, you know, I think when you think about, you know, what is Juneteenth seeking to do, mm -hmm. right? What is Juneteenth seeking? It is seeking to, to celebrate and to elevate beyond circumstances it's not just like a you know think about what it is it's june of 1865 right union army rolls up like yeah you're good here now what has happened two years late two huh. two years late so wait two two years late of what uh the civil uh, war, end okay. Of the civil okay. war. Okay. okay all right yeah, oh yeah oh yeah yeah it's so yeah. so so two years late and so you know, it's not just that it's late, it's also we're in this moment of reconstruction. The greatest missed opportunity in American history. Yes. We can fight about it in the comments if you want. The greatest missed opportunity in American history. Right. And so you have people trying to to actualize themselves in a world and certainly in a country that to that point was like, you're not people. Mm -hmm. So now you have people trying to figure out personhood from bondage. Like, that's... Right. I think we don't think about how deep that is. You're trying to figure... Not that you didn't know you were human. Right. Again, it's not that, but being human in public. That's what it is to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you have people figuring that out. And so what are you going to do? You're going to embrace and celebrate the values that you were already cultivating and articulating even in bondage, and it's, it's, it's an anchor, it's a piece of identity. So, you know, Juneteenth, it's fascinating to me on certain levels to see the, the national embrace mm -hmm. of which I am in many ways wary of, you know? Um, but what we do factually know is that this is a Texas holiday. 
This is a Southern holiday, yeah. profound and deep and important, because what does it do? Again, it is an anchor. It lets you know from whence you came and from, to where you are going. So bring it back to the Exalt Choir, that's what the choir seeks to do. It does a lot of traditional gospel music, all right, traditional black gospel music, but it also does any number of contemporary interpretations of that music, of, of what that sort of elevating and, and identity affirming and confirming that, uh, that that body of work can do. Watch past episodes of Generation Rising on ripbs.org slash Generation Rising and new episodes every other Friday at 7.30 p.m. Please check our schedule for dates. Thank you for joining us this month. We'll see you next time in case you missed it. <laughs>